And I certainly thank the organizers and everybody involved in this webinar for setting it up. And what I'm going to try and do is to put together in a one health capacity some of the things that we all should know, as well as some of the things that we've talked about and reiterated along the lines of this seminar already this morning. And so, for example, given that there are the recommendations both globally from WHO and OIE or locally from the United States in regards to the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices or the Compendium of Animal Rabies Prevention and Control, there are formal documents. But as you know, every day at the local level, the state level, the regional level, the national and international level, there are issues that arise that are into the gray areas. And so, as we often know, we could be at conferences and you could be standing in the queue and you overhear someone who was, while caring for a mongoose that was hit by a car, and the animal died and was buried two weeks ago. What would you do? <coughs> now, of course, we use this. It could have been a cat at a conference, as actually happened <coughs> in real time, or in this situation as to one of the local reservoirs. And so we're going to go through a couple of scenarios that Okay, maybe the names have been changed to protect the innocent or the guilty, but by, by and large, you know that many of us have been in these situations, and that's one of the reasons why, at our level, the Emergency Operations Center 24-7, we're available to answer questions in these gray areas from our states, state epidemiologists, as well as at the local level, uh, oftentimes in the middle of the night from an emergency room. And so would your response be that, well, all veterinarians are vaccinated, so we don't have to have any concerns about rabies in this situation over this mongoose hit by a car in El Yonke. Do we have any people who would agree with that statement? I don't see any hands raised. Should we suggest that the animal be found, this was the buried animal, but not worry if the tissues are unsuitable for diagnostic testing because of the low incidence of disease in these mammals? Uh, Brad, what do you think? Would you agree with that? No, we wouldn't agree with that one. And in addition, we have no incidence data for animals if we think of truly applied epidemiological the terminology for incidence applied to wildlife, let alone the issue about unsuitability of tissues, etc. Not worrying about it, meaning that this is not in October in Alaska, this is October in Puerto Rico where it's a Caribbean island. Or perhaps we should inquire uh, from a welfare standpoint that we really need to find out who hit this mongoose. Not only from the standpoint of prophylaxis of the driver who hit the mongoose, but also um, perhaps liability issues. Do we think that that's a strong public health consideration in this situation? No, I don't think so either. And perhaps we should just mind your own business and not be good citizens and not offer any of our opinion because you know what happens when you offer your opinions from things that you overhear. And anybody who's caring for an injured mongoose, perhaps we should not be concerned about the Orwinian selection anyway. <laughs> well, you know, obviously none of these are the correct answer. And if possible, it would be ideal um, because perhaps the animal may have been buried very deeply, in which case it would be along the lines of mean annual surface temperature, although probably if you think of a mongoose in this situation, it was more likely disposed of and is now dining with the Lord of the Flies. And in essence, if this was a veterinarian, we would hope that because they're occupationally exposed here in Puerto Rico, that they would have pre-exposure vaccination, the likelihood of obtaining this animal, obtaining suitable diagnostics are low, in which case a booster recommendation in this situation if in fact the criteria for true exposures are obtained. We all agree to that. I don't see any dissensions in the audience. And so we're sound asleep and we receive a call from a prominent university hospital. It's been a fairly young immigrant who was working in the sugarcane industry who complained of a typical prodromal here that we might think about for rabies. And approximately two weeks later, he's now intubated after developing encephalomyelitis. And all other diagnostic tests have been proven negative, recognizing that not only is this a neglected disease in the world, and many of us who work on it are similarly neglected, but obviously it's a diagnosis 
in humans, particularly of neglect. The differential diagnosis for rabies in humans, at least in developed countries, is low. And it's after all the usual suspects come out negative and the patient has not been diagnosed and we think about it. So the resident of this ER is wondering about the possibility of rabies and the utility of experimental treatment. Particularly, this is one of the topics we talked about this morning. So what would you recommend to this physician? Well, you could go ahead and suggest that good luck, but you know, rabies is a likely situation in this case, and there's no experimental treatment. Anybody strongly believe that is an answer? No. Or perhaps we shouldn't be concerned about rabies because anybody would know about a bite exposure. And so obviously we don't have a history of exposure. We shouldn't even be thinking about rabies. Does that sound correct? No, I don't think so. In fact, the epidemiology of human rabies on the mainland is that most of our human rabies cases of indigenous origin have no history of a bite. And in fact, the current case that we're dealing with this week fits that scenario. Perhaps we should suggest to the resident that the patient who's thought of to being rabid, that we should institute post-exposure treatment. Sorry, prophylaxis. Because it's not post-exposure treatment. We're not waiting for people to develop rabies. Prophylaxis suggests a preventative. Preventative after an event but before disease. So obviously we don't recommend post-exposure prophylaxis. One, because it's never been shown to be effective in human or animal models. And so there's no evidence base to start this. And two, potentially it could be counterintuitive and actually dangerous from the standpoint of early death phenomena. Or perhaps we should go ahead and suggest maybe we should airlift the patient in regards to this inquiry at a US institution uh, to the closest Pasteur Institute along the lines of the good gooey. <laughs> um, anybody believe in that scenario? No. And of course, with homage to our French colleagues as well. So the answer is obviously none of the above, and as I hope that we, we beat that into the ground, anti-mortem diagnosis, anti-mortem diagnosis, anti-mortem diagnosis, and the critical samples collected appropriately that are not only available um, on many web pages and on our own, but obviously we're available there for consultation as to what to collect and how to collect it and how to package it and how to send it, as many of us do on a routine basis. Different situation. One morning you get a call, and of course this might be a travel situation. And during this past summer, so it's been after the, the solstice, a traveler to Russia was bitten by a dog. A bitten person received prophylaxis there, consisting of at least five local vaccine doses, by local I mean locally, obtained and produced, not an imported vaccine, doses over the course of no month, over one month, but never received any immune globule. And today, they've just presented to this travel clinic um, or to their physician, and they want their 90-day vaccine booster as suggested by those local recommendations. So obviously, we have a variety of possible opportunities. Um, perhaps we shouldn't be concerned because canine rabies has been eliminated from all of Europe. Well, we certainly congratulate all of our European colleagues for doing an excellent job on a regional basis, not only from the standpoint of dog rabies control, but also wildlife rabies from the standpoint of mammalian carnivores over most of northern and western and southern Europe, recognizing there's still a background for wildlife rabies. But we may not be able to go ahead and say that canine rabies has been truly eliminated from all of what we consider within continental-based Europe from the standpoint of the Ural Mountains going to the east. So obviously that's not the answer, i.e. don't worry about it. Or perhaps you're very well-intentioned, maybe we should just go ahead and import that brand from Russia and bring in that dose and give them a night day night. Does that sound like a reasonable goodwill intention? I don't see anybody really <coughs> rushing to the microphone to agree. Um, and since the patient didn't receive any immune globulin, 
maybe we're very concerned that we should go ahead and administer some rabies immunoglobulin now. The patient's healthy, so it's not contraindicated. Does that seem like a reasonable thing to do? No, again, because they've received a vaccine, we're concerned that potentially they are mounting an immune response, and so to go ahead and administer immune globulin by itself this late, irrespective of anything else, would not be the ideal scenario. Or perhaps we could just go ahead and suggest that, look, talk to you about not getting bitten. You went and got bitten. You shouldn't have woken up that dog that was sleeping. You were bitten. It's your responsibility. You decided to start prophylaxis and not interrupt your trip. So it's just indeterminate. You need to go back and continue finish prophylaxis, starting with what you ending with what you started with. Does that seem like a reasonable answer in this situation? No, I wouldn't think so. Oftentimes, you have options. The utility of rabies management in humans and other animals is you always have options. Some people could do consultation. They could find out that this was an own dog, and it's been under observation, and no prophylaxis was necessary. You have options, and that is if you don't know anything about this biologic, and you have some concerns, questions about it, one of the options to use to begin prophylaxis all over again, if from your risk assessment you believe that was necessary. Or another option, maybe, to go ahead and pull a serum sample, ask for a stat rabies virus neutralizing antibody test, and while the patient is thinking, waiting of what to receive, if the patient comes back and there is no response, then obviously you have the option that we just discussed, starting prophylaxis anew, recognizing the incubation period of rabies can be very long. Or if the patient does have rabies virus neutralizing antibody, oftentimes, primarily for not only the patients, but also our own modicum and so that you can sleep at night, some people may administer more than a single booster than would be indicated in this situation. Um, but they already have rabies virus neutralizing antibodies if in fact that's what the test would suggest. We know that most people present for prophylaxis because of dog bite scenarios and you're investigating a typical one. So as often happens, you know, we've been to an international conference and we're relying upon the graces of our friends, the dog sit for us. And as the owner of a new German Shepherd puppy, I can empathize with this situation um, because this dog has separation anxiety. So one day while the family's visiting, the dog escapes from his very confined space and severely bites the small child that they decided to come over and use your facilities because you have a home theater and they don't. And the parents are very concerned about possible rabies virus exposure uh, from, let's say, Atlanta. How would you manage that? Well, you can go ahead and tell them, don't worry about it, because they just called us and, you know, my dog's been vaccinated. And just forget about the whole thing. Does that sound like a reasonable response? No, the child was bitten severely about the face and head. So why don't we just go ahead and they're coming home soon, observe the dog for five days, and then just let it go and forget about it. Five days sounds like a reasonable time, right? No, the 10 day observation period predicated what we talked about with the pathogenesis issue is that it's insufficient for an observation period. Why don't we just go ahead and wait 14 days and if the child remains well, no prophylaxis is needed. We're talking about a relatively severe bite to the face and head. So obviously waiting for two weeks is not the acceptable answer. Or, look, you never really like this anyway, and this dog's always running over and doing its business in your yard, so this is now a perfect excuse to go ahead and say, we're concerned about the child, and let's go ahead and euthanize the dog. And you're not really worried about rabies, so we're going to bury it before we get home so that nobody else is going to be bit being good stewards of the neighborhood. Well, obviously, you're not going to suggest that either. And it's nice to have options. Doing your risk assessment, you find out that this is a vaccinated dog, multiply vaccinated, that it's well supervised, that it never goes outside because it's hyper and you're afraid of it running away, and it's a true German Shepherd, it's not an American German Shepherd, so it's expensive. 
and you find out that in fact it was a provoked fight because the people that were there were really not supervising their child who crawled under the fence and was pulling on the dog's ears and tail. And in fact, um, that it's probably not as severe as you'd expect it. So none of the above is obviously the answer, but you could, if the dog was ill, obviously go ahead and suggest euthanasia and diagnosis and risk the friendship. Or you could go ahead and start prophylaxis while the dog is being observed and stop. Or you could, on the basis of what you find out about the dog and its history and its vaccination status, do nothing beyond the medical care associated with the bites itself. Tetanus vaccinations, antibiotics as needed for sepsis, any wound care, etc. You have options based upon the circumstances. And typically, this is the way that most risk assessments do. The caller wants to tell you everything except the key questions. And so in your risk assessment forms, you should have, if you don't already, in your own mind, written down <coughs> the key questions that inevitably the caller never provides to you. And so pull back instead of focusing upon the questions at the time. Situation like this, you have an urgent query from a concerned father. Many people are being reassigned. They're relocated and they elected to have their two-year-old receive pre-exposure rabies vaccination. Oftentimes because for children in particular, one of the recommendations for relocation to an indigenous country um, or countries, if it's necessary, that pre-exposure vaccination be given. But he was informed today that because his child was two days late for her second vaccination, that really it would be prudent to start the entire vaccination series over again. And so you're going to be forced into giving your opinion. In this situation, and we were very sad we didn't have uh, participation from our South African colleagues, uh, but we know they've been making great progress in one of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation projects in South Africa. Tell them you know, there's nothing to worry about because South Africa's rate is free. Sound like a reasonable management thing? <coughs> Lillian coughs no. But maybe we should go ahead and agree with the practitioner for this child and suggest let's start pre-exposure all, all over again. Why worry? Reasonable option? I get one sign saying no. No, we don't have to go ahead and start all over again. Instead, maybe we should just go ahead and give immune globulin as an immunological bridge, and when they get to South Africa, then they can continue with whatever is locally available. Probably not the best option here. Immune globulin is contraindicated in a pre-exposure situation. Or perhaps, given the dangers of international travel, why don't we just leave the child home with other relatives until she's older, because the vaccine is not licensed for such young children. <coughs> not recalling seeing many pre-exposure series for children of that age? Obviously not. One of the issues that's in the ACIP is that gives you the options. The difference of a few days over a schedule, and people think that in all the schedules that there are from Louis Pasteur's time to date, that the number of doses in those days is set in stone, and it's not. The immune system doesn't know if it's on day seven or if it's on day eight, or if it's a convenient sample given on Friday instead of the Saturday, or Sunday, you have to be there on a weekend and wake people up. You have flexibility in these such that a difference of a few days on either side is not critical that you do not almost ever have to repeat such a series or have that child undergo pre-exposure. Recognizing that every independent event, even those of you that are very, very safe vaccines, you do not want to risk the variety of potential misadventures that can occur. The time to take a steel needle and bridge with such a strong biologic. Now, these are all real calls. I mean, I might say South Africa instead of Russia. I may say Russia instead of South Africa. But these are all real calls. And typically, when we were asked to put these together, they were gleaned from about the last month of interesting calls that we received. About an exposure in the neighborhood, local residents stepped upon the carcass of a dead animal with its bare feet. There were some lacerations that were observed. And the animal can't be located this morning for testing for the excellent diagnostic laboratory. Let's say it's New York, for example. And in addition, the person is poor and doesn't have any health insurance. This wasn't a New York case. It was on the other side of the country, but we can pretend. And so what would you say if the person doesn't have any money? Somebody's got to pay for the biological. 
but you don't have to worry because you've got great surveillance and there hasn't been any rabies diagnosed in this place for a while. So just don't worry about it. Is that like a reasonable thing to do? No, I wouldn't agree either in terms of real time. And re remembering that all surveillance is biased, surveillance is very much biased for some other non-domestic animal. Or suggest that rabies can only be transmitted by a bite and this wasn't a situation in this case. Leave me alone and go home. Now obviously almost all rabies cases are caused by a bite, but non-bite cases can occur and have occurred. Or dismiss any concerns because rabies viruses can activate quickly in dead animals. Well, it may be true if we're talking about Atlanta in the middle of the summer and it's a roadkill animal on the tarmac in a much different situation if it's October in Alaska. So it's not inactivated that quickly and it's not going to be relevant in this scenario. Or suggest that the person move someplace else and get some free prophylaxis. I know we were amazed to hear that Sri Lanka provides free prophylaxis this week to anybody who comes. And so I know they'll be getting a huge boost in their tourism probably from their neighbors abroad. So obviously this isn't the situation and the answer's really been given from um, what we've discussed on each of these uh, points already. We get a call from Italy and about a month ago, the short young woman was feeding a stray dog here in San Juan and she was bitten on the finger. And upon going home, she didn't consult with anybody, she just started prophylaxis because they didn't want to be worried at all. And now she's a newlywed and a month later, she wants some advice about how long she needs to wait before she attempts to become pregnant. This is a real, this is a real call. I know because I took this call. It's changed a little bit, but this was a real call about someone who was bitten and started prophylaxis and wanted advice from me about how long she should wait before getting pregnant. And because she started prophylaxis, maybe it'd be reasonable to wait six months before starting. It sounds like a reasonable period to wait, doesn't it? No, of course it doesn't. Or recommend that Adoption might be better because we know that there are severe adverse events associated with the rabies vaccine and we don't want to take any risk. No, obviously that's not true. And we don't have to tell her to wait at all because she shouldn't have received prophylaxis at all because we don't have to worry about any rabies acquisition here in San Juan and Dr. Rivera is shaking her head sadly like, no, that's not the situation. Um, and perhaps because we talked a lot about diagnostics, we should go ahead and have her saliva serum and perhaps a skin biopsy test to rule out that she doesn't have rabies before trying to get pregnant. Now, obviously that's not it. I don't know why there was a disconnect and there may have been suggestions about transplacental transmission and because it had the R word in it and maybe she had rabies circulating. This was a very bizarre, it was one of the most bizarre calls of the summer, shall we say. And obviously there's no known waiting period for when you should attempt to do X, Y, Z after receiving rabies prophylaxis, but I did not make this question. Farm worker finds two stray dogs and was scratched by one. They bring both to a local humane shelter. Jesse's remembering where this actually occurred. After seven days of isolation and rabies vaccination, the dogs are then brought into the general animal population into this humane shelter. Five days later, one of the dogs is adopted. And three days after that, that animal sickened, is euthanized, and rabies is suspected by a local veterinarian based on the clinical signs. The dog became an apodent, had fever, um, had local paralysis, started wandering around, and started a very aggressive behavior, whereas otherwise very shy. So what would you suggest in this situation? Go back and vaccinate the farm worker immediately. That's not the issue at hand here, given the length of time between when these events occurred and when those animals became sick. So at first that might be relevant, depending upon if the farm worker was exposed or depending upon the temperature of time. Or perhaps because of the risk of transmission, we should euthanize all the dogs in the shelter because we want to be very, very safe. Does that sound like a reasonable thing to do in this scenario? No. Or simply provide reassurance 
that rabies is a very rare possibility given the location in the Middle West of the United States. I mean, there's almost no rabies there when you look at the maps that Jesse showed. He's laughing. No, obviously that's not the answer either. Or perhaps we should just see if the veterinarian has pre-exposure vaccination and insist the same for all the technical staff. Again, not our primary concern here. The issue is one about diagnosis or observation. Get prompt diagnosis. Lillian made the high sign. Euthanize the dog. Get prompt diagnosis. You'll get a diagnosis on the same day. The animal's not rabid. All bets are off. Unfortunately, in this situation, the animal was rabid. Unfortunately, it did lead to the euthanasia of many animals, and it goes back to the basis of <coughs> risk assessments, proper animal supervision, primary vaccination, quarantine of animals put into the general population, education, vaccination, diagnosis. This was a lesson learned given the consequences of many of the animals that were euthanized because the dog was rabid. One health capacity at the Agricultural Office, given our colleagues from USDA, thank you very much for attending today. Um, you learn of a potential problem at a goat farm in the southeastern portion of the island. We can talk about the island here. It could be any island, an island in the Caribbean, your neighboring Caribbean islands. Farmer reported a recent death in a young goat after an acute episode, loss of appetite, braces, ataxia, and paralysis. The animal was killed and eaten. <coughs> Goats are excellent eating, depending upon their age and how it's cooked. And now this person's concerned about possibility of rabies because a rabbit dog was diagnosed at a nearby farm. So what's Wildlife Services hotline going to suggest? Vaccinate everybody who ate the goat. Right? Is that what you would recommend? No. Dave Bergman is saying no. Euthanize and test all of the goats at the farm. Nope, we're not going to do that either. We're going to provide reassurance that goats aren't susceptible to rabies, because we hardly ever see goats reported in Jesse's though all animals are susceptible. Check to see that the report of a rabid dog was accurate, and if no documentation is found, because the dog was only based on clinical signs or suspicions, I know we heard about there was a rabid mongoose at El Yonke, but it wasn't diagnosed. And if we can't find the documentation, forget about it. Just say it was rumored. No, and in fact, this was another real-world situation. And what one would do is a risk assessment. The goat was caught. Everybody who consumed goat was the goats was cooked. There's no risk to people who consume the goat. Although obviously we don't recommend the consumption of any rabbit animal in this situation. Um, if we find out that in fact the people who butchered the goat could have exposed themselves, obviously prophylaxis would be relevant and uh, follow up thereafter because rarely do we have animal to animal transmission. There could be concerns about confinement of other animals that may have been in contact with this goat, but otherwise it's not an issue. Timekeeper, how much time do I have? Ten minutes. Ten minutes, oh plenty of time. <coughs> young nursing mother along with her three young sons undergoing pep because they found a bat in their home while they're sleeping. And she was Everybody's very savvy about everything there is to know about everything today because of access uh, to computers. And was concerned because they're taking, they're very much interested about um, holistic medicine, and they're taking high dose vitamin D. And they're worried because of the immunosuppressive effects of that. And now they've gotten some contact dermatitis at the time of prophylaxis initiation. So should this young mother be concerned about all of these variables? And the most interesting thing about rabies is it's always variable, it's always a little different, and it really puts you in tune with nature, biomedicine. It really is an excellent One Health model. So obviously we think we should, she should go ahead and stop vitamin D because of its immunosuppressive effects and revaccinate her immediately. It sounds like a very reasonable thing to do, right? No. You wouldn't really have to be taking mega doses for it to be that immunosuppressive. Remember the issue about risk assessments and pooling back. So maybe we should go ahead and, because we've got a great diagnostic situation, we'll do a stat test for rabies virus neutralizing antibodies. It's just down the road where the laboratory is. That way she wouldn't be concerned, right? No. Or provide that there's 
no concern because this happened in Puerto Rico. Have you had any rabbit bats in Puerto Rico? Not that we can document. Not that you can document. And so because there's no rabbit bats in Puerto Rico, we just tell her there are no rabbit bats and provide reassurance. No, because it's an issue of surveillance bias or lack of introspection perhaps. Or perhaps, and we've learned many things this week at uh, Rita, we should just suggest she stop nursing immediately because there's the possibility of viral transmission, transmammary, transmittal <laughs> to her son. No, obviously, we're not really concerned about that. When you pull back, what actually we found at the soy meeting, don't get too introspective. The question that we asked was, was the bat rabbit? And the response was, well, no, the bat wasn't rabbit. But how do I know I can trust, test, trust the test results? And so the entire question soon fell apart because there was no need to start prophylaxis anywhere. That's what I mean about pulling back and looking at forests rather than trees. Many of us we know are very concerned about cat care um, as they're wandering around our neighborhood. And we've got an aggressive Tom, scratches her and it disappears. And two weeks later, after speaking to her physician, she receives one milliliter of rabies immune globulin and vaccine on day zero, but she gets a severe adverse event after this occurrence. So should be, she be concerned? Well, because it's probably not related to immune globulin, why don't we just suggest she get another dose of rig administered in her gluteal muscles? No, contraindication. And we don't have to worry about it because she wasn't bitten, she was only scratched, so we don't have to worry about rabies at all. No, we could have non-bite transmission. And because of the adverse events, perhaps corticosteroids might be suggested <coughs> to minimize the adverse events. No, obviously we're more concerned about rabies virus transmission. Or perhaps check next week to see if anybody's reported rabbit cats in that neighborhood. Little to no surveillance going on in rabbit cats. Obviously, you don't go ahead and stop prophylaxis for minor, and so you could go ahead and have non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. You could always switch to a different vaccine product. So there are options here, as well as hopefully contact local animal control, see if anybody can track that cat or if it reappears again. Um, are we open to the question time, or have I used up all well, my question time? We've got five minutes for questions or five minutes of presentation? Five minutes of presentation. Plenty of time for questions. Oh, plenty of time for questions. And I didn't think I'd have enough time at all. Um, one of the situations that also arose live time during the meeting was one of our participants was actually bitten by a cat here, uh, was actually scratched by a cat on her foot because it's warm and she was wearing sandals. And we had the options of what to do. And so one of the options was, let's just go ahead and start immediate prophylaxis for this patient because she was one of our own, which was a strong consideration. But rather, let's pull back and find out is the cat available in this situation? That's the utility of having such excellent colleagues and a network. And in this situation, the cat was found. The cat's found to be healthy. It was a non-bite, so lower risk situation. Washing the wound with soap and water and close consultations with public health authorities to see if in fact the cat remains well. Also knowing something about the relative epidemiology in the area, we have not had rabies reported from this immediate area, it's a very well maintained hotel. And so in this situation, you have the animal in hand, low bite situation, the animal is otherwise healthy, prophylaxis wouldn't be indicated for ACIP, and along the lines of the compendium, the animal will be observed for a 10 day period, and if in fact it remains well, all things should be fine. Now, this was a cat, we don't think it was vaccinated because it didn't have a collar, it had some ear mites, it had a strong odor. Um, and in that situation, should we go on ahead and suggest that, well, it's probably a naive cat, probably never vaccinated at all, while we're doing the 10-day observation period, let's go ahead and start a primary vaccination. Does that sound like a reasonable thing to do? On the one hand, part of you wants to say yes. I agree the cat should receive routine veterinary care. I agree this cat should receive vaccination. But I don't think I'd go ahead and vaccinate it just yet. Not because it's going to mask the signs of rabies per se, but depending upon the vaccine and how it's administered, if the cat squirms or not, and develops an adverse 
event? How are you going to know if the animal is clinically normal or not if euthanasia should be recommended? So ideally, we are very much about vaccinating cats, uh, but I don't think it's necessarily a great idea to do it at the beginning of the observation period because it could compromise the recommendations you would provide to the patient regards the profiles. Is it time for questions? Yeah, it'd be a good time to go to questions. Thank you, Jesse. It'd be a good time to go to questions. Uh, Peter Coster, are there any online? Nobody has any questions online. I see the good Dr. Russell has a question for me. Yes, I sir. Um, I've, I've had this, the uh, pleasure of circumstances in which uh, physicians, even though your assessment shows that there's absolutely no reason to administer uh, uh, post exposure prophylaxis, physician absolutely positively uh, not only wants the um, prophylaxis, but also wants the animal. I test the animal perfectly healthy, um, with no indication of any problems. I've even seen it when the animal is perfectly vaccinated and healthy. Um, address that scenario. Good question. We have a situation whereby, such as the one we just explained, the real-time example, the animal's available, um, consulting physician in this situation, strongly believes prophylaxis should begin <laughs> for a low risk situation, and not only that, but once the animal tested. We recognize that every situation is different. We recognize that prophylaxis is a very difficult decision, and it's between patient and healthcare provider with public health consultation. Obviously, it's always up to the patient to decide in those situations, and oftentimes against the good counsel of public health authorities, against the wisdom of their healthcare provider, patients elect to do some things. And so the best explanation of that is to provide what we know about the facts, both about rabies virus pathogenesis, what we understand about the facts of epidemiology, what we understand about the facts of transmission. And within that realm, it's really a democratic situation as to how somebody should or not receive prophylaxis. On the situation of demanding for an animal to be euthanized, I think you have a little bit more leeway in this situation if it was an unknown cat and fell to the jurisdictional responsibility. And oftentimes it could be governed by local law or local recommendations. There may be uh, rabies prevention acts. There may be animal control acts. So oftentimes there may be jurisdictional recommendations that fall into play. But otherwise, we hope that the dialogue be between informed uh, well-educated biomedical in a One Health capacity individuals that will be able to come to a successful outcome. But we recognize oftentimes that's not the situation. If it was a case whereby for the public good we had a shortage of biologics, then obviously it could get into a litigative matter. Not that's going to resolve it locally, but oftentimes in emergency situations where in a low risk situation it's a provoked exposure or low risk exposure, not a strong epidemiological consideration for prophylaxis, that potentially the public health authority may supervene over the local patient or uh, physician depending upon the circumstances. We also recognize that there are cases whereby exposures occur and the individuals, some may want the animal euthanized and others may not. It may be in a high risk situation, meaning a bite situation and a high uh, prevalence of rabies in the background. We have to also have to recognize that, at least in the US, no person can give up their right to health in regards to a high risk situation for an animal. And in situations like that, we hope that most of the jurisdictional laws or regulations would supervene and have the euthanasia of the suspect animal rather than impose or enforce that anybody should have to receive prophylaxis unless it's actually indicated. Particularly, there may be contraindications based upon prior allergic reactions in the rare situations of adverse events with some of the biologics we have. Any other questions in the, the audience? Yes, yeah. Dr. Rivera. Uh, yes, can you clarify for some of the colleagues um, that are present here today there were some questions as to what are the recommendations for vaccination of an animal um, that has bitten 
which you just discussed, it's bitten a, a human versus the animal that has been exposed himself and goes into um, quarantine. Exactly. The question was, what about someone who is bitten by an animal and whether or not there's a recommendation to vaccinate that animal that's under the 10-day observation period being suspected of rabies as opposed to a naive animal that is exposed to a non-rabid animal and what the management opportunities may be in that situation. We've already discussed the former situation that ideally they should be confined, look for any signs of rabies and the first suggestive signs of rabies, the animal should be euthanized, its brain examined in a competent public health laboratory and if the animal is negative, no further prophylaxis is, considerations are needed. If the animal is positive, post exposure prophylaxis. In the situation of the naive animal, exposed to a known rabbit, laboratory diagnosed, or to a suspect one. There are options. Mm -hmm. One could be that because you truly suspect the transmission event is going to be real, the animal's unvaccinated, the animal's a laboratory diagnosed rabbit animal that did the transmission. It was severe and multiple. And because there's no owner who's going to take either veterinary or legal responsibilities in situations like that, and there could have been multiple people exposed. Oftentimes, euthanasia of that suspect animal, depending upon the circumstances, could be done. Or strict quarantine for a six month period, again, depending upon the circumstances. The other option's a little bit more controversial. And it, it shouldn't be when we step back for a minute. And that is, do we administer post-exposure prophylaxis to the animal? If the animal's a vaccinated animal, of course, it wouldn't be a six month quarantine. In this situation, an immediate booster, 45 day observation period. If the animal's unvaccinated, or we don't believe the animal is vaccinated, do we go ahead and administer post exposure prophylaxis to it? In some situations, there is a recommendation that one could go ahead and start, leave the animal is not vaccinated, vaccination of it. It's a little bit more controversial as to whether or not we truly believe, based upon the evidence, that that vaccination only post-exposure immunization of a naive animal exposed to one is going to become successful. Having said that, we have done post-exposure prophylaxis real-time for certain animals. Um, that is one of the compendium recommendations, depending upon the circumstances that it can be done. And there are oftentimes in other situations where working with the individuals at hand, that state under the auspices of the state veterinarian and ourselves, the post-exposure prophylaxis has actually been conducted. For example, um, one real life situation, a zoo was building a, an exhibit for bats and they brought in a large number of bats and one of the bats was rabbit. And one of the options of course was, what do they do with all these bats? They spent, let's suppose, $11 million on this exhibit and countless amount of person hours in adapting these bats to captivity and what should they do? That was one of the options. The other option was, we were contacted, could we do post-exposure prophylaxis? Similar vein, university has a large colony of bats, a lot of investiture, there's no human exposures. Let's suppose there's several hundred bats involved here. Should they go ahead and euthanize all the bats, either in the zoo situation or in the experiment one-on-one -on -one for university? In this situation, discussed with the Institutional Animal Care Use Committee, responsible parties, um, the people from the public health standpoint, post-exposure prophylaxis was instituted into these captive populations. Whether it was successful or not, all we can report is there were no further animals reported in either of these situations. The animals developed antibody, and when I say prophylaxis, it was full. It was rabies immune globulin, together with what at the time was five doses. Why was that done? Well, because the public health ramifications were small, all the individuals agreed, there were no humans at risk, and from the experimental, we have very little data. And from the applied veterinary side, one has to ask, why do we not have licensed post-exposure prophylaxis for the naive animal for many of these situations? Because animals serve as the surrogate, as the basis for many of our public health decision-making processes for post-exposure prophylaxis for homo sapiens. So it depends. It depends on what are the relative public health consequences or benefits into these two situations as to what one would do in that management situation.
and oftentimes it has been for captive and confined uh, zoo animals that often even have ranged to the standpoint of beavers, where they had beavers exposed to a rabbit beaver in the zoo situation. It has actually been done for post Yes, sir. I think the, the part of emotional intelligence and dealing with uh, with the consultations uh, is, is very important, especially when you get involved in, in these difficult cases. The easy ones are easy, but the difficult ones are not that easy. I remember being an expert witness once in a case where this uh, tourist was in the southern part of Puerto Rico and was uh, sunbathing next to the pool. And the mongoos came and bit him. The mongoos hid and nobody ever found him and apparently uh, got some local consultation that there was no problem. But as he was boarding the plane, somebody came and stopped the plane from taking off, asked, asked him to get out of the plane, that he needed to be immediately vaccinated or he would die. The patient apparently went into a post-traumatic syndrome and uh, even though was protected for rabies, uh, sued the hotel for this traumatic experience. Again, tr somebody trying to do well, the message didn't get across correctly and cost the, the patient some some trauma. Uh, we just had an excellent comment from the audience about the need and the utility of emotional intelligence because the straightforward issues about rabies prophylaxis are easy. It's these harder ones, such as the example of a tourist bitten by a mongoose who did not receive the appropriate advice at the time, and upon boarding the airplane was told he needed immediate prophylaxis or would die. Rabies is a very traumatic situation. I mean, it's deep in our psyche for a reason. There's probably some selective advantage to that from a term that we recently coined from a homo socio mimetic complex, i.e. trying to answer the why things are. Why are the things they are for certain diseases going all the way from smallpox to rabies? It's complicated, it's integrated, and it's not just a simple issue of rabies, the adverse events that could be associated with the biologic, which are very rare given modern biologics, but the emotional intelligence and maturity that helps to go ahead and control post-traumatic stress situations, which any time you're going to get into a situation that one's life is in danger or perceived to be, that is going to have an effect. This is an issue why we can't be cavalier, and post-exposure prophylaxis thank you, Jesse, is not simply a matter of writing a script or telling somebody, look, this is a life-threatening disease, you need to get vaccinated right away. Obviously, this is going to have an effect on some patients much differently than the other. I think probably some of the situations we have in dealing with rabies prophylaxis in a one health capacity, it's a huge opportunity and at the same time it's a huge responsibility. And one of the things that has not been captured in health economic models to date is what if this is the cost to the patient in terms of this traumatic event that potentially will have many life altering events down the road. Anybody from on? Yes, sir, Mr. Peter Costa. Thank you, Dr. Ruprecht. We actually have a bunch of questions online, and there's two <laughs> questions. <laughs> How much time do we have? We'll go up 15 minutes. 15 minutes? I'm glad because there was nobody saying anything. Yeah. So we have two questions uh, from uh, Dr. Fadbo in Saudi Arabia. And his first question is if you can kindly comment on giving rabies post exposure to a person bitten by a farmed ostrich that was not tested for rabies. <coughs> Can we stop right there? Is that the first question? This, this was an excellent question. And I'll bet this is one of my colleagues playing a joke on me. We, we have a question from our, uh, one of our listeners in the audience from Saudi Arabia that was bitten by a farmed ostrich. And should they receive post-exposure prophylaxis? My current WHO, OIE, and from the U.S. perspectives, ACRP and compendium, we would say no. In fact, even Dr. Rivera used the example in her talk. We know that there are millions of iguanas here. I'm sure tourists are coming into contact with iguanas falling out of trees as they fall asleep, the iguanas that is, um, and post-exposure concerns. We've had people in the United States vaccinated 
you know, they're being exposed to something that we later found out was a bird, or we later found out was a moth, or people getting hit at night while they're jogging by things getting in their eyes. That, so it's an excellent question. But people are always getting exposed to something. We know that not only all mammals we believe, but probably all warm-blooded vertebrates are susceptible. And so in a worst case situation, um, experimentally, if we had the right bird model, could we actually use these as models for rabies? The answer is yes. In fact, we use avianized tissues for the production of some rabies vaccines. And in the older literature, if one looks, one can actually find stories of foxes getting into hen houses and a goose developing rabies after an encounter by a, uh, a fox, of course, pre modern diagnostics, and then supposedly this goose running after somebody and nipping them and that farm worker developing rabies. At least that's what's in the literature. But of course there's a lot of things, particularly along the lines of Grimm's fairy tales as well, um, before the modern age. So I think we're open-minded enough to think that in experimental situations, birds can be susceptible and found to be rabid. However, there have been a number of epidemiological studies looking at populations at risk, uh, such as raptors or such as carrion eaters. And although they're susceptible in theory in captivity, uh, there's absolutely no supportive epidemiological data that birds are important in nature, and at least within modern time, no suggestion of transmission. So therefore, despite what the science and the academic and the ethereal might suggest, or what the literature in a historical matter um, might suggest. Along these lines, we would say no, prophylaxis would not be indicated from a ostrich bite or exposure at a farm. And if in fact you really believe this was rabies, well I think the ostrich would probably be ill. And again, along the lines of suggestions or concerns or clinical suspicions were that great so as not to have post-traumatic stress situations Bottom line, if they're that concerned, euthanasia of the ostrich, an examination by a competent, well-trained, along the lines of modern diagnostic techniques, should remove any doubt or suspicion. Do we have any strong concerns over that? Anybody want to administer post-exposure prophylaxis to an ostrich exposure? I see no one agreeing. I hope we answered that question. Thank you. The second part of that question is similar post-exposure uh, indication after being bitten by rats? Another excellent question about rats. Much more real life, and one almost has to step back. I don't recall if Jesse, from the U.S. perspective, showed the slide about rabies and rodents. And you'll notice we didn't talk about rodent rabies. We also talked about rabies in horses. We talked about rabies in cats. We don't talk about horse rabies. We don't talk about cat rabies. We don't talk about rodent rabies the way we do about mongoose rabies and bat rabies and raccoon rabies for a reason, and that is, as far as we're aware, based upon evidence, surveillance, laboratory-based diagnostics, rodents are not reservoirs. As far as we're aware, they're rarely found positive, with exceptions. As far as we're aware, there has not been documented transmission of virus from rodents or small-bodied mammals, such as insectivores, to humans. And oftentimes, in fact, one of the reasons why Jesse Blanton called the unusual suspects is observer bias. Now we're not saying there have not been transmission from some kind of small body mammals. When we're talking about small mammals, biologically we're oftentimes talking about insectivores or rodents, because obviously bats are small mammals, but not from the standpoint of the natural history what we tend to think of small mammals, bats and small mammals. And so somebody could have had transmission from some small body mammal, some mongoose are small, where it necessarily was not a mammal, I'm sorry, not a Rodent. We also have to recognize that unfortunately in the computer age, nobody gets out and plays in the dirt anymore. And oftentimes people are misconstruing mongoose as squirrels. You know, we've be we're becoming more and more um, ecologically, taxonomically naive. Nobody has an appreciation of nature anymore. So a lot of times these reports of so-called some small-bodied mammal, uh, which is huge in its conception, Somebody may have been exposed to something that developed in rabies. We also have to recognize that bites by rodents, and in particular rats, are not rare. And so you've got a huge epidemiological database that no reservoirs, 
and frequency, frequency of occurrence and exposure, and yet no documented transmission. That unless it was an unusual event, and one just arose recently, Sun Huang was uh, sitting in a park situation, and a squirrel ran over to them and severely started acting unusual and biting them, and they left and went to take care of the wound, and came back, and they found the same animal acting in an unusual event. It was an unusual situation, in which case the recommendation would be to go out, capture the animal, and diagnose it. Because even in the U.S., we have on average 50 to 60 cases of rabies diagnosed every year in rodents, but they tend to be large-bodied, i.e. along the lines of woodchucks or groundhogs and uh, beaver, which are in contact with a very common reservoir like raccoons, oftentimes with altercations over homes, that is burrows. But despite the frequency and diversity and distribution of rodents and the encounters between them, I'm unaware of any laboratory-based documentation um, for that situation occurring between growth and human, i.e. rabies transmission. We have a gray zone there, and that is that uh, we believe, uh, or the knowledge around uh, in the island is that rats go on during the night and, uh, and mongooses go out during the day. And that's why they don't meet. But when you have an exposure at night, somebody goes to their kitchen and a small mammal bit them and there was food around that you would think it's a rat that bit him. The question is, is a mongoose that has rabies, can he recognize the difference between day and night? And, and, and uh, what do we do when the person never saw the little animal that bit him? Uh, do you go out and prof uh, you know, give post exposure prophylaxis? Excellent question. So in the case of you're bitten by something in the night, and you think it's something furry because you may see it out of your peripheral vision, situations like that, and because of this taxonomic, taxonomic ignorance, we know they've been bitten by something animals not available. Again, depending upon the circumstances, based upon what you know about rabies in your situation, in this case, one of those small mammals that could be misconstrued as it was as a squirrel, as a rat, one errs on the side of caution and it would be prudent. In a situation where it's different, that you know it's a rat, either because the person is, they're very knowledgeable and they see it during the day, or even at night because the lights are on. Much different situation when we know or think what it is as opposed to one of the unusual suspects that could be misconstrued with of an animal concern, whether it be bat or whether it be mongoose. When a situation of routine rodent bite, particularly in urban situations, has occurred, the recommendations are not routine prophylaxis after routine rodent exposure with the emphasis, bold, flashing, highlighted, in quotes, with the word routine. Yes, sir. The ne next question online. How much time do we have? Well, I, I'm Plus. tailoring my answers to how much time we have. So that's seven, seven minutes. Seven minutes, okay. I can give a seven minute answer. A couple more questions. We have plenty there. Next question it come from, comes from Madison, Wisconsin. And if a person awakes to find a bat flying around in their bedroom, there's no evidence of a bite, the person doesn't believe that the bat landed on him or her, the person opens the window and the bat flies away, should this person receive both exposure and prophylaxis? Thank you. And thanks to the folks in Madison, Wisconsin. It's a typical situation that we have bat in the bedroom, as we call it. The lessons learned of what we understand about bats in the bedroom has been to change the conventional wisdom, and that is when you're unsure if an exposure has occurred, one should not be opening the window, one should not be releasing the animal, but rather one should either safely, if it could be done that way, capture the animal for prompt laboratory testing, or call someone who would feel comfortable to do that. That's one of the lessons learned. In this situation, of course, it wasn't a lesson learned, and the window was open and the animal escaped. As Jesse knows from recent experience, this is a very traumatic event, and it depends. It depends on what we understand about the epidemiology of rabies in the area. So if this was Hawaii, and the bat escaped, and there was no history of a bite, it's a much different situation than in the continental United States. 
in that situation, typically one of the things that we've suggested as to the risk assessment of public health management is to explain to the caller what we understand about rabies and its epidemiology and how it's transmitted. What do we know? One of the other things we go along the lines of is sensibility. And that is, was there a bite sensed? Is this person otherwise normal? Um, is there anything that could, if not congenital in an acquired fashion, that could affect the sensation of a bite, which by definition is a noxious stimulus? If they're otherwise normal, from either congenital or acquired, the first issue has to do with sensibility. They're a light sleeper. They're not taking any medication. It wasn't a week, three-day weekend. Um, there wasn't any parties going on at all. And we know none of that happened this week because we were working from 7 to 7, at least. Um, and so there could be situations right there it stops. And nobody has the time for a seven-minute answer. How long does it take to take out a pen and a pencil? Well, a pen and a paper and write a script. Much easier with managed health care today. So it depends. Many patients right away will say, based on what you've explained to me about the epidemiology of the disease, its relative rarity, um, what I would need to sense if I wasn't otherwise affected uh, by disease or by acquisition. I'm an adult. I make the decision I'm not going to receive prophylaxis. There's still some other patients that are unclear. And beyond the sensibility issue, there's the detectability one. And that is we recognize that even though bat bites are small compared to carnivores, that it's still a bite. And as a noxious stimulus, it's not just rabies virus we're concerned about, but there's a wide variety of flora in the mouth of that animal that by definition is going to lead to inflammation, albeit small. So the trauma of the bite will be small, but a bite, by definition, is an event. The inflammation may be small, but it strains the imagination to think you've just had a bite from a dirty bite and your skin is completely normal. Now you're combining two things, not all well, three things. One, your knowledge about the epidemiology pathogenesis of how rabies is transmitted. Two, have you been able to sense anything? And if you say, no, I sense nothing, and oftentimes we ask, would you be able to experience or detect a sharp prick in the middle of the night? And oftentimes people say, yeah, I think I should. And the last one is whether or not you can detect any lesion from that noxious event. And they say, I went in and looked at it and I saw nothing. In fact, another real world situation that we must have spent hours with this patient in regards to what we know and understand and asking these questions and recognizing it was her decision. It was her decision in line with her primary health care provider within this box that we call public health consultation. And at the end of those many hours, she elected not to receive prophylaxis. We also recognize if people continue to call and hours go on and the hours become days and the days become weeks, this has an effect as well. And if people can't feel reasonably assured, given all the issues, concerns, fears about rabies, Prophylaxis is oftentimes the effort of last resort, but we hope it's an informed decision. So the answer to that one is, it depends. Prophylaxis is recommended when there's a reasonable probability that exposure has occurred, because the person may not recognize that they were bite bitten and may not recognize a bite, particularly with the temperature of time. And that, I believe, was the last event. I'm sorry, was it a seven minute answer? <laughs> so we've got time for one more question. One, one short question, one short answer. Question. question, we've got a question from the Navajo Nation. Yes, yes sir, Dr. Ben. When you have a public health hospital who is two and a half hours from the closest pandemic rabies, and they are using upwards of 3,000 doses of PEP for every dog case uh, by consent, what would be your approach to the physicians that are doing it who I cannot convince that we have not had pandemic rabies on Navajo since 1949 and yet they're wasting food amounts of money on PEP? It's an excellent question from the Navajo Nation about the use of public health resources 
Now, for routine, all dog bites, or for the most part, most dog bites, um, although one has not had a rabid dog diagnosed under those circumstances for a long, long time. Excellent question, and I think it comes into one of the reasons why we're having this webinar and session was to try and provoke discussion between veterinarians and physicians, between nurses and veterinary technicians, between biologists and other biomedical care people that were all part of this. There's no absolute answer, particularly um, when it's a legacy and perhaps when one gets a change in new staff as opposed to people who have always been doing things one way or the highway, but, but a dialogue is, is the way to go. And there's no absolute, I, I do not believe it is um, considered ideal to vaccinate every single dog, particularly if it's a provoked bite and the dogs are otherwise healthy, and particularly if the dogs are anywhere available uh, for observation, in the light of what you feel secure and can provide evidence of adequate surveillance as the occurrence or not of rabies in that situation. But otherwise, it's an excellent uh, concern of the conflicts in our society when communication between informed, educated individuals does not occur. <coughs> and we have no more time, or we have time for one more question, or what's oh, that? One. We have time for one well, more I'll question save one. from I'll our save host here in Puerto Rico. Yes, sir. Mongoose fights with a dog. Human intervenes and gets the saliva from the dog by the, the saliva from the dog that was fighting with the mongoose. And the human is there, and the human says that all he had was contact with the dog saliva yet you know that the dog and the mongoose had an interchange and you're then dealing with the mongoose's saliva you think or the mongoose's blood you think or the mongoose's product you think or the mongoose's brain this is an excellent question for the audience about the person who handles the dog that fought with the mongoose or the raccoon that lived in the house of Jackville. Um, very frequent situation. And I hate to say it, the answer is it depends. And if the person has no cuts, if the person came in and washed after it, you know, a lot of pe people are concerned about germs. First thing they do is hand sanitize. Everybody does that. Situations like that, there is no exposure. If, on the other hand, they felt their other hand, they may think in the act of this, they see a lesion, it could have been from a tooth of who knows what, or they have an open lesion, and situations like that, and you can't differentiate, could have this been raccoon saliva, mongoose saliva, etc. you're gonna err one way. So one is, no, no exposure, the other one is, could be exposure, and then there's your gray area. And again, it goes through the dialogue of what we have not had. We've got direct rabies transmission, by bite, some probability of transmission by non-bite, direct. What we haven't had is indirect non-bite transmission, which is another powerful bit of evidence, which oftentimes should, in informed decision-making, steer one towards not prophylaxis, but another one of those gray areas that keeps both people up at night. 